Good afternoon, everyone. We are Novofish Therapeutics, and we have developed a disruptive solution for one of the most pressing challenges in infectious disease. Antibiotic-resistant superbugs are one of the biggest and fastest growing clinical problems today. And what Novofitch has done is supercharge nature's own antimicrobial agents, which are called bacteriophages, in, in order to make them into new human therapeutics. Bacteriophages are natural agents that kill bacteria and that are harmless to humans. So whether you're a football athlete or a student in a community or somebody that come, come, just came out from a hospital, you're subjected to antibiotic-resistant infections because they can happen to anyone. And antibiotic-resistant infections uh, are a multifaceted problem. First, the number of infections has been growing rapidly over the past five years by 200% to affect two million cases per year, causing the death of 99,000 people. On top of this, these infections are becoming harder and harder to treat. This graph shows the rapid spread of antibiotic-resistant superbugs over time on the green curve focusing on MRSA infections. We see that in the 1980s, if you had a staph infection, which is one of the most common pathogens in the hospital, there was about a 1% chance that this infection would be resistant to antibiotics. However, if you have the same staph infection today, you have over 60% chance that this infection will be resistant to methicillin and other common antibiotics. In combination, uh, compounding these two problems, there's a decrease in the number of tools that is available to clinicians in order to treat these complicated infections. Can you explain your, uh, that decrease in the new antibiotics and, and, and specifically address it from the perspective of a, of a pharmaceutical company and the market? Uh, why is there so little innovation? Okay, there's two sides that I would like to bring. The first is on the technology side. There's been, a de um, there's been a lack in the discovery of new targets for small molecule antibiotics. Now, to, di to directly answer your question, for the large pharmaceutical companies, there has been a shift from focusing on uh, acute diseases, such as these infections, to focus on chronic diseases, which at the time they established um, to be a higher revenue stream for them. So these three problems create a very difficult situation for the infectious disease community. And Novophage is bringing a solution by combining traditional antibiotics with genetically re-engineered bacteriophages in order to increase bacterial killing and, most importantly, suppress the evolution of bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Can you tell us what the status is of the five patent applications and the timing? Okay. Mike, why don't you answer this? Certainly. So we have filed five patent applications through Boston University and MIT, who are both the co-holders of these patents. Um, several of these patent applications have gone to the PCT stage, and two of these patent applications are very new, so they are not yet in the PCT stage, and we're still putting more data into them. So timing when you think they will get issued or disallowed? The timing for that, so we're looking into in-licensing in the summer, then developing it a little further, filing the patent application for the PCT side, half a year later, and then essentially go through the application process, so about two years, I would say. And then your relationship with MIT and Boston University on them, you said verbal agreements. What, what does that mean? And that is correct. So we are um, discussing uh, with the Boston University and MIT TLOs. We've received a verbal agreement to be granted an exclusive worldwide license for all fields of use. We've received a standard term sheet that we're evaluating currently. We have received some free counsel from friends at a law firm, and they've advised us that some of the terms are very reasonable, some of the terms we have to give them pushback. In brief, we expect about 5 to 10 percent royalty rate, hopefully a little less, several milestones that are all in line with uh, such deals, such as going into phase one, two, three clinical, first seal in the U.S., and we definitely want to push back on some of the more specific terms that they put in there, for example, sponsored research agreements. What are the cash requirements that you expect you can arrive at with your license? I'm sorry. What are the thing? cash requirements and timeline of those? For Fortunately for us, at least in the short run, in, at least in the short run, both BU and MIT are more than happy to accept cash, uh, accept equity in our venture in lieu of cash. So they are most likely uh, taking an equity position, which is also good because it aligns them with our, with our interest going forward and allows us to preserve the cash for operation and the development of the technology, which is really the most important part for us right now. How much equity? Sorry. We have not had the discussions about how much equity. So, so we but have, upfront payments, I, I missed that. The upfront payments. Um, 
so Boston University and MIT have had outlays of about 50K for patent costs so far, and they have been verbally agreeable to take equity in lieu of these cash payments. Can I, this issue of a verbal agreement, Yes. Um, explain, I mean, are these conversations you've had with the, you know, the, 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 you know, the actual head of, of the respective? With the actual head of the um, UN MIT TLs, yes. And uh, as it relates to next steps, I mean, just give me the glide path. Certainly. Uh, it sounds as if you've, you've traded uh, 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 terms, is that? We have not traded terms. Okay. We are in very good relations, fortunately, with both uh, TLOs. And they believe in us as the main technologists who are the sole inventors on these patents, essentially as the core team that will be bringing this technology to the market as technologists. So they have agreed to us to say, look, we're going to give you the, uh, the term sheet and let you look at the term sheet. And then when you're ready to retain counsel in the summer, then we'll talk about the terms. I'm hoping Phil can t ultimately tell me how this is going to work. But um, I'm going to jump to how, you, how you're going to distribute it. You say on page 11, can leverage its novel products to gain access to distribution and manufacturing expertise. Mm -hmm. That is that correct. seems really light. Um, so what we're planning to do, and we'll get to this hopefully very quickly in the presentation, we plan to form uh, an agreement with a large pharmaceutical company such as Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or even Cubist Pharmaceuticals because they are faced with immediate patent expirations of their largest still proprietary antibiotics. And we can both extend the clinical and patent lifetimes of these antibiotics via co-formulation with our agreements, such that we can leverage their expertise in manufacturing, distribution, sales, as well as gain access to their capital, and also, importantly, for startup credibility. Have you had any of those conversations? We have not. We have reached out to Johnson & Johnson, however, more on their development venture fund side. And is there a, a, a capital structure that you're proposing, or is, did I miss that? No, nope, you actually did not miss that. We have not proposed a capital structure because we are the core technologists, and we realize that we need to attract senior business leadership that is both uh, seasoned in raising money and dealing with venture capital firms as well as large pharmaceutical partners, and also bring them, bring a uh, therapeutic through the FDA regulatory approval process because us being PhD students, we have never really dealt with any of these uh, issues. We do have a plan that will show kind of the expected development of their product through those phases that we'll show in a bit. Okay. So we believe that we are the right. We believe that we are the right team to bring this technology to market. Anne DeWitt finished her PhD from MIT and has been working for five years as a research manager at 3M Pharmaceutical. She's now finishing her MBA from Harvard Business School. Tim uh, finished his PhD from MIT uh, and is also finishing his MD from Harvard Medical School. He's an expert in the engineering of bacteriophage and has received the MIT Lemelson Prize as well as the Collegiate Award from the National Inventors Hall of Fame on the technology that we're presenting today. My colleague Mike is an expert in bacterial resistance mechanism and is obtaining his PhD from Boston University. I am myself finishing my PhD from uh, MIT as well and will be focusing on no uh, novel antimicrobial therapies. So have you, have you guys talked to any potential business people to join? Yes, actually we have. So all of our advisors, who we'll be showing you later, are very well connected in the Boston uh, venture science, uh, venture community. And we have specifically talked with several of their friends at large venture capital firms, such as Polaris and Flagship, more these two firms. Who's working on the, in this team, who's working on it full time? So you're at McKinsey. I was at McKinsey. Was, 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 OK, I'm oh, sorry, I, mis, I misunderstood. I quit that. my job at McKinsey to pursue a PhD in uh, academia, and now realize that I really want to put these like bioscience products back in the market. So the three of us have been working together for over two years. And Mike and I will be continuing to push the technology development for the first clinical product out of Bob Langer's lab at MIT, where the technology and where Novophage is being incubated. Tim just received a, a, a position as an assistant professor at MIT and will continue to drive the, techno the core bacteriophage technology that will serve for Novophage. And Anne will continue to drive the business development as a senior associate at Flagship Venture, a VC firm in Boston. The, mar the market that we're addressing is the $25 billion global, anti global antibiotics market, and it is split between skin and skin structure infections, urinary tract infections, pneumonia infections, and other types of infections. The technology that we have developed is able to address all of these infections, but Novophage will focus onto skin and skin, uh, skin and skin structure infections in order to enter the market. And there are several advantages to focusing onto this particular indication as an entry point. 
First, it has a very large patient population of over 150,000 patients each year, and they are easily identifiable by doctors. Secondly, one out of four patients is affected by MRSA, which is a resistant strain of Staph aureus. Thirdly, uh, skin infections are an established market entry point in the antibiotic space. Cubis Pharmaceutical entered the, the antibiotic space in 2003 through this particular indication and was able to derive significant profit growth th through uh, significant uh, off-label use of their antibiotics as well as follow-on indications for the blood stream infections. And in 2008, had a revenue sales, uh, had a sales revenue of over $400 million, which represents about 10% of the U.S. proprietary antibiotics market. So I'd like to describe to you how the, the disruptive technology we've developed actually works. So shown here, these oblong objects represent bacterial cells, and they're living in what we call a biofilm. A biofilm is a community of cells that sticks to surfaces, and they form on all sorts of medically relevant surfaces, like catheters, medical devices, orthopedic implants, and so on. And what they do is they protect bacteria against antibiotics, and therefore can also lead to antibiotic resistance. Now, as Tanguy mentioned, antibiotics can kill bacteria, but because of antibiotic resistance, they're often ineffective. What Novophage has done is to combine an antibiotic with an engineered bacteriophage. Again, these bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria and not human cells. And what we've been able to do is to engineer the DNA of these agents to supercharge them and make them better therapeutic agents. Can I stop you there? Sure. You mentioned that you would reformulate existing antibiotics that were coming off, uh, yes. coming off patent. Give us an example of what that was. So, sorry, the greatest example would probably be Leviquin. Uh, it's a $1.4 billion antibiotic coming off patent next year. And we've tested it with uh, drugs that are in the same class, essentially, as Leviquin. Um, so, this uh, synergy between uh, the antibiotics with the engineered bacteriophage enables significantly increased killing. In our experiments, it showed up to 30,000-fold uh, increases in that bacterial killing. In those experiments, uh, what, what, what strain of bacteria were you talking about? What species so, strain? So these are proof-of-concept experiments done with E. coli. Right. Um, so you know, clearly moving on, we're going to go into MRSA, and that's going to be part of our plan. Um, we're, going to, we're requesting a seed fund, that we're, a seed investment that we're going to use to build our first clinical product. Right. Would you stipulate that killing Staph aureus is substantially more difficult than killing E. coli? Uh, I think that what those problems have actually even worked out. So essentially what you need is an antibiotic. So there's many antibiotics that can go after Staph. There's a bacteriophage that can go after Staph aureus, which we've already identified, which is broad spectrum, can infect all known MRSA strains. So actually I think the principles are all the same in that case. But the population, the medical population you're treating aren't uh, afflicted with uh, um, methicillin resistant E. coli. They're Exactly. So until, until you show it in, in Staph aureus, you have a big, I mean, that's a big value creating exactly. milestone, wouldn't you say? Yes. How hard is it to do that experiment? We don't think it's hard at all. We built the designs here so that basically they're in uh, genetic cassettes that can be easily popped in from one place to another. So then that's why we think that this is actually quite readily addressable. How much would it take for you to do that experiment and how long? So the, we're, we're, you know, the seed investment we're asking for is $500,000. The actual experiment of constructing the bacteriophage is relatively cheap. I would say ten to twenty thousand dollars at most. The, the, what we really want the money to do is to build our team and license the technology and also start testing that uh, first clinical product in an animal model and other in vitro testing. Have you considered raising not five hundred but fifty to get that critical value creating milestone done before you raise the money? Yes, that's definitely one of the things we're talking about. We've raised, we're working on some grants as well that will support us in that regard. Okay, go ahead, please. So. Um, one of the very unique things about our technology is that we have a therapeutic that goes directly against the biofilm. Um, antibiotics typically do not directly go against the biofilm. And what we've done is to engineer the DNA to express biofilm degrading agents that can break down that extracellular material that stabilizes the biofilm. And so in our experiments, we were able to significantly destroy the biofilm up to 10,000 fold. Furthermore, another thing that makes us stand out significantly from antibiotics is that we can suppress the evolution of antibiotic resistance. So one problem with conventional antibiotics is that they can actually induce mutations and actually cause antibiotic resistance to happen. We've engineered specific resistance suppressors into the DNA that can knock down the genes in the, DNA, in the bacteria that are responsible for causing antibiotic resistance. In this case, we've been able to minimize the evolution of resistance by 600-fold, and we've tested this with three major classes of antibiotics, including the quinolone drugs, the beta-lactans, and the aminoglycosides. Furthermore, we've also tested the combination therapy on populations of bacteria that are already antibiotic resistant. And we were able to rescue uh, antibiotics that essentially were useless on their own. So this is a very significant uh, improvement over conventional therapies. In terms of a go-to-market go to strategy initially, 
I'm coming back to this formulation issue. Mm -hmm. You know, w would you view yourself essentially as a formulation company, or a reformulation company I, as a, an immediate sort of go-to-market strategy? No, I don't think so. I think there's there's several options that we'll show uh, in a bit. Um, you know, our technology really is in the core engineering of the bacteriophage, and so we could apply it to reformulate a, in a joint development agreement with a proprietary antibiotic. Another option is actually to combine with the generic product and actually bring our own proprietary therapeutic to market. So these are all options that we're actually considering. Um, so Tengi mentioned the issue of finding targets uh, for antibiotics. We've expressed broad spectrum antimicrobial agents, shown here as the screws, and what they can do is poke holes in surrounding bacteria and thus broaden the efficacy of this approach. Now this work has been published in two peer-reviewed high-profile journal papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy, National Academy of Sciences and has been validated in a preclinical animal model of infection. So these mice were infected with pathogenic E. coli and subjected to a variety of different treatments. With no treatment, about 10% of the mice survived. With an antibiotic alone, in this case, ofloxacin, which is in the same class of drugs as levaquin, um, you got about 20% survival. Now, we ran a, a series of different controls, but if you look on the right, the novophage solution, which is the combination therapy with an antibiotic and an enhanced bacteriophage, was able to achieve 80% survival of these infected mice. And this was without any optimization of the pharmacokinetics or the dosing of this co-formulated co product. In addition, we did not observe local or systemic toxicity in these animals. Would you go back to the slide? So sure. it looks as though it isn't synergistic, but rather additive. The engineered bacteriophage gets you 60%, the afloxacin alone gets you 20%, and the two together gets you yeah, 80%. I, that's a great question. So I think in the animal data, since it's, it's not really powered enough to find that synergy, so in the in vitro models, I can show you the data, actually, that shows that kind of synergy happening. Good answer, thanks. So um, natural bacteriophage, we believe that our product has a reasonable path through the FDA, primarily because natural bacteriophage therapies have been approved by the FDA. So in the realm of food safety, three companies are currently marketing a spray to kill listeria bacteria on lunch meats and cheeses. They were approved in 2006 by the FDA and are generally recognized as safe. Now in terms of human therapeutics, there are two companies doing natural bacteriophage therapeutics that have gone through phase one and phase two trials. Now our proposed first product is combining the antibiotic with an engineered bacteriophage, and we believe that this solution is much more efficacious than the natural bacteriophage, as well as the antibiotics alone. But we want to leverage off of the expertise the FDA has developed with these other uh, companies in our own process moving forward. Now we've identified, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, these are, th those are risks of mitigation for the business. Let's talk about technical risks sure. for a second. Yeah. You've, um, you've engineered the phage. Mm -hmm. And have you spent time studying how long it takes or if the E. coli that you worked with have become resistant to this mechanism? Yes, actually, Mike can actually answer those if you yeah, answer. That's actually a great question. So um, one of these things that we've shown you before, the little screws are the broad spectrum antimicrobial agents that poke holes in any and all bacteria, so they're not specific. However, if the bacterium uh, develops a resistance against the uh, bacteriophage that is attacking itself, the remaining bacteria that are still infected produce these antimicrobial peptides that kill off these few resistant bacteria. So essentially, we're lowering the bottom of the evolution of the resistance against either the antibiotic or the bacteriophage. So you've diminished the rate of resistance against the engineered bacteriophage. Right. That is correct. But the next question is, is, but is there resistance against the bacteriophage? Yeah, we can never say that the resistance will never occur. However, in our experiments, we have not observed it over okay. one or two weeks of evolution. One or two weeks of evolution. Yeah. And then the next question I have is, is it a true statement to say that bacteriophage is exceedingly difficult to contain? And that so, that, so that once you, once you dose a patient, mm -hmm. patient in Boston systemically, right. that the presumption is, is that bacteriophage has been released to the environment and will, will spread fairly rapidly. That's a great question, actually. And um, we are waiting to receive guidance on it from the FDA. And the reason for that is what you uh, uh, alluded to is the replication of the bacteriophage. And Tim has actually a great answer for that. Right. So there is actually strategies, and people have done this already, to make the bacteriophage non-replicative, yes. turn them into an inert kind of delivery mechanism. And that's something, if we receive information from the FDA, that that's something that would take to bring this product forward, where I think it's totally capable of doing that in terms of technological so you, point you of view. You put it, a, 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 pardon the change of uh, venue, but a poison pill, if you will, inside the bacteriophage. Right. Exactly. So that it only works in that one patient, in that one environment. And exactly. Time. Yes. I understand. Thank you. No problem. Um, so we've identified four key areas of risk and have started to work to mitigate these risks. I've told you about the regulatory path that we believe is uh, going to happen. And, and we've started to speak to two regulatory experts, Peter Hutt, former chief counsel at the FDA, as well as Alan Green, another regulatory expert. So based on those conversations, we believe there's a manageable path based on uh, former uh, natural bacteriophage companies. And our plan is to engage with the FDA early on in development to really understand exactly what they're looking for in our technology. 
We're also considering the European other markets because uh, other EU countries actually have more uh, comfort with bacteriophage therapies, including the UK, Belgium, and Georgia. Um, in terms of intellectual property, we touched on it a little bit before, but we have five patent applications covering the general concept of engineering the biocombusting agent, the resistance suppressor, and the broad spectrum antimicrobial agent, as well as the specific sequences that we would like to use in our first clinical product. This is in contrast to the natural bacteriophage, which can only be covered by method of isolation patents since they're natural agents. Now, our initial freedom to operate uh, appears to be clear, but we need to do more work on that front for sure. And we're going to continue developing our patent strategies as we move forward and make technological advancements. In terms of market acceptance, we've chosen MRSA infections because we believe that's an area of critical need. And we believe that because rapid MRSA testing is increasing leading hospitals, this will help us uh, to gain market acceptance. Furthermore, we we'll continue to partner with infectious disease experts currently mostly in the Boston area, but we hope to expand. We've also validated our technology with the Centers for Disease Control, basically showing that we can elute these engineered therapeutics from artificial surfaces, such as catheters and so on. Finally, in terms of manufacturing, we believe this is a mitigatable risk. Because natural bacteriophage products have been manufactured for food safety, now, a human therapeutic needs to be more pure, and so we believe that we can develop FDA-approved manufacturing technologies based on existing biologic uh, processing methods to attain GMP uh, a level uh, purification. We've uh, spoken with Steve Sofin, who's the VP of Biologics Manufacturing at Genzyme, as well as uh, Peter, uh, <coughs> Frank Risk, at the VP of Purification at Genzyme as well in this regard. Tell me about the freedom to operate. What, what you know, you, you mentioned you've, you've conducted an analysis there. Just in some detail, what, what uh, has that analysis yielded? Right. Um, so the freedom to operate analysis essentially included a search for patents that are concerned with bacteriophages. So natural bacteriophages cannot be patented because they're naturally occurring organisms. So all the patents that are around this space are about the isolation and manufacturing of these. So our technologies are novel because they combine elements from bacteria and move them into bacteriophage, constituting a new organism. And we believe, based on that, we have the freedom to operate. In terms of other uh, patents that have basically covered similar concepts, we haven't been able to find any of those yeah. in our initial searches. So on the business development side, we've touched already on the first and the third um, item here that I want to point out to you. Um, the joint development agreements with a large pharmaceutical company, such as Johnson Johnson, Pfizer, and Cubist. Um, however, in the middle, we also plan to outlice the, techno the technology to the food safety market. Tim has already told you that the food safety market has accepted bacteriophage technology, and our technology presents a significant upgrade in the efficacy. The opportunity for us is here to generate some early revenue in our operational stages while we develop human therapeutic approaches. So, so how do you generate the 150,000 revenue in year one and two from out-licensed out technology? Um, that number is based on a very broad overview of a lump sum licensing structure deal, and that is mainly uh, my assumption. And how do you defend it? Um, the value of the market for food safety is about 200 million, and there's these three main companies that produce bacteriophages. The rest of the market is fragmented. It's mostly large and slow uh, antimicrobial manufacturers that are limited in the efficacy of the antimicrobials because the FDA won't allow for larger, of these, for larger amounts of these rather poisonous chemicals to be used in sterilizing the food. So with the rise of resistant bacteria in contaminations of food, which has been seemingly the case if you believe the press, we believe that the market share that can be captured by a bacteriophage company that uses these advanced technologies that we give them, we can justify this price for an out license. How long does it take to get a go or no go with a joint development partner? You mean for a large pharmaceutical company? Yeah, J, I J, J, I J would or Pfizer. My friends have told me it takes anywhere between six months and 12 months from the initial stages, then going through data, validating it, going through the different hierarchies. And do you pick one or do you do three of them simultaneously? That's a great question, actually. So the options are limited by what we can negotiate with our partners. If you are Pfizer and you want to have this technology and believe it's worthwhile enough for you to in-license it and you want to make sure that nobody else can extend the patent lifetimes, then you would certainly want to make sure that we cannot negotiate with anybody else. However, for us, it would be more advantageous to be dealing with Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and whoever it is. So it's going to be a trade-off in the negotiations. If we were only to partner with somebody exclusively, we would be charging a premium for that, obviously. Now, for the joint development opportunities, um, these are some of the market numbers for the um, antibiotics that are proprietary and are coming off of patent protection. At the very top, Johnson Johnson, as Tim already mentioned, produces Leviquin, which is a fluoroquinolone that is very similar to the ofloxin that we used in our studies for the uh, mice that are susceptible to E. coli. 
$1.4 billion sales, patent expiration in 2010. Now, all of these are antibiotics, even though they belong to vastly different classes, can be co-formulated because, uh, can be co-formulated with our bacteriophage because it's an aqueous formulation. Now, I just want to run you quickly through these. Say that, I'm sorry, say that sorry. last, that, that was a great clause at the end of your sentence. All of, all of our, all of our, all of these, all of these antibi antibiotics, even though they're from vastly different classes of antibiotics, they essentially compromise all the different classes, can be co-formulated with our bacteriophage because it is an aqueous formulation. Because it is an aqueous it formulation. It is an aqueous formulation. Interestingly enough, our bacteriophage is actually much more stable than these small chemical molecules, so we don't have a problem with shelf life. Now, from our development side, um, we're asking for $500,000 in the seed round, mainly to translate the proof of concept <coughs> data, uh, the proof of concept technology, to a clinical prototype against MRSA and complicated skin and skin structure infections. Do the in licensing of the technology and, importantly, attract the business development team, the senior executives that have a proven track record in bringing these technologies to market and also navigating the FDA and raising money. So, with this clinical prototype, our core development team and the uh, senior business leadership. We plan to go out, raise a Series A for preclinical animal studies, pharmacokinetics, toxicology studies, as well as scale up a GMP manufacturing protocol. At this point in time, next year, we'd also be pursuing uh, an out licensing deal with a food safety uh, sector company. Can I come back to this sure. seed, seed round? The, um, you have a verbal yes. agreement. Yes, we do. Um, and that really bothers me. There's something about that that just really bothers me. Sure. The, um, you know, I think the, 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 the realistic opportunity to raise a seed round, and unless it's from parents or whatever it may right. be, is probably going to be very low until mm -hmm. you have a, an, ex, uh, uh, an executed license. The other thing that concerns me is you're effectively building the value of the intellectual property uh, uh, at the two institutions. And That's correct, yes. for all intents and purposes, um, you're showing them the value of, of the IP. You're negotiating against yourself. Mm, that is true, and so we have to build the technology at the uh, institutions because we are at the institutions that. and still need to graduate. But <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but we believe that we can take actually a term sheet. A term sheet is still non-binding, but most of the time, a term sheet that has been negotiated with us, with our council, and the T, uh, the BU and MIT licensing offices will be translated into a license agreement, and that term sheet will allow us to go out and go to investors and say, look, these are the terms. Are those reasonable or not for us to give you some money? Is the, is the development of a business plan a, um, a condition of the license? No, it is not. OK. Um. So raising, raising the A round for the preclinical, as I've just told you, then raising a B round for a phase one, filing the IND, BLA application, then going forward, phase two, necessitating more money because phase two clinical trials are obviously much larger. And at that point in time, we'll be looking for the large pharmaceutical company to partner with. Now, this process can start earlier, preferably if we're in phase one. If we get good data back from phase one, we can go and start the negotiation process. Now, um, your revenues are kicking in in year eight. Is, is that the normal development cycle? It is at least year eight because you need um, several years of preclinical work, then about one year for phase one, a year for phase 2A, then another year for phase two, and then the significant portion of time is spent on a very large phase three trial that determines the efficacy and safety of your data. And at any point in any of those trials, you can get bad news. Yes, you can. However, for antimicrobials such as ours, as well as small molecule antibiotics, the rate of success is greater because the translation is better from an animal model to a human model. The reason is that we're treating the bacteria that are infecting the animals. Those are the same bacteria that are infecting humans, as opposed to, for example, a cancer drug, where you have to work with a cancer model in mice, in mice and then have to translate to a human host in a human cancer that is while similar, markedly different, and then you can get some very bad surprises. And when you go to J&J, &J, how long is the line outside that office? Uh, for antibiotics or yeah, for, for other things? We have, actually, <laughs> we have actually not looked, but I imagine for antibiotics, their door will be wide open. How do you reconcile how long this takes with the expiration of the patents? Um, we hope that the patent expirations will force a large pharmaceutical company that wants to protect its significant revenue stream <coughs> to talk to us and then basically put in more funding so that we can go through it a little quicker. You can still get, even though your patent expires, you can reapply and get a new patent. So they might have to live with an off-label um, of their um, proprietary antibiotic for a year or two and then basically reformulate it and, and get it back to the market. Current reformulation, current reformulation strategies 
are, sem are essentially simple elongation plates. They include adding sugar, makes it a little bit better metabol uh, makes it a little bit better to metabolize. Now we're not adding sugar. We're adding we're adding a biologic that significantly increases the clinical and also their panel lifetime. Um, and is 25 million kind of the ballpark number that? 25 million dollars is a ballpark number, and that is based on a large um, phase two and phase three trials that was um, deployed by Cubis Pharmaceuticals that concluded in 2002, just prior before they got approval. It's about 21,000 dollars all in per patient, and about 1,000 patients in all arms of the clinical study. The good thing about an antibiotic trial, as opposed to a larger and more costly cancer trial, is that it's a very defined uh, outcome. It's about seven days to a 14, 14 days treatment with a uh, shorter observation time afterwards. And you can say, yes, the patient is cured. No, the patient is not cured. You keep saying the, the good thing about these trials, but go back and say that since the 1980s, only two have been approved? That's that, it? Yes, please. So I think that's been more on the technical issue of coming up the compound in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not that you know, the trials are very bad. The issue is the technological ability to find a new target, find a new small molecule that gets around the resistance mechanism. So let's ask it this way. In, a, in the overall average of pharmaceutical development, if you are starting phase one, you have a, say, a one in four chance of success in becoming a marketable product. Right. What's the chance of success for, for antibiotics? Oh, that's, that's a great question. But I've actually, I've actually not gone back and evaluated the rate of, of, of failure for their antibiotics. because. They all happened in the 40s and 50s when all of the low call, the low hanging fruit, the so called low hanging fruit of antimicrobial targets were being evaluated. But essentially, I hope that the chances are better than one in four. And once you go through phase one and phase two, you are pretty much, well, you should never say never, but you're more set than before. I've said things like that before. Let me ask another question. Yes. Um, it didn't work out well for me either. Mm. The um, question I have is this. You talked about cystic fibrosis as mm -hmm. an alternate that is area correct. Of, of treatment. Can you give me one minute on how that works? Like, sure. Definitely. So Please. the issue on cystic fibrosis is a pseudomonas. Uh, pseudo cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease. It causes a difficulty of clearing out uh, certain long-term infections inside the body. One of the most serious things there is pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they form these biofilms, these very sticky secretions that are difficult to get out. So we have developed a very targeted biofilm degrading agent that we can go in and break up those kind of secretions and the protective material that the pseudomonas can build. And therefore, we think that by applying that to uh, pseudomonas biofilms and cystic fibrosis, we can provide a new therapeutic that will relieve these patients of their infectious disease load. That wasn't even a minute. That's good. <laughs> Let me ask another. So, so that leads me to the next question. What you have is, as all therapeutic development plans have is the risk that the regulatory agency or the data will do you in. Right. And the regulatory risk is going to be driven by things like you're going to put a genetically modified organism mm -hmm. that might be able to spread widely mm -hmm. all on its own into people. Yeah. And so that's going to drive the risk profile up. Right. And at the same time, you're, you're going to be treating MRSA, which although it ha does have a death rate, isn't stupendous the way cystic fibrosis is. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, have you considered using cystic fibrosis as a beachhead market yeah. in order to overcome, because the risk is, you know, if you have a patient who's 14 years old mm -hmm. and has CF, mm -hmm. their lifespan is not considered to be a very long one going right. forward. So you're going to have a much easier time in getting everyone's attention in terms yes. of being able to treat it. Have you considered using that as a beachhead market and shorting, shortening your timeline into that critical proof of yes, concept? Yes, definitely. We've, we've given that good consideration. One of the things that definitely supports what you said is that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation actually has quite large grants that support novel research on this, mm -hmm. on this front. So that's definitely something we are evaluating. You know, the technical development of the actual prototype is actually not that difficult or expensive to do, as I mentioned. So I think these are things that we're going to be evaluating as we go forward. Mm -hmm. We're not stuck to MRSA, I would no. say. <laughs> certainly, certainly not. Um, so you've seen the investment amounts that are necessary, and I just want to show you some more uh, good numbers that are essentially the returns of uh, companies in the antibiotic space that have recently, last four or five years, been acquired uh, as a function of where they were acquired in their development program. So you can see, obviously, concurrent with the amount invested, there are significant step-ups in valuation uh, going from preclinical to phase one, phase one to phase two, with an average of about $375 million, and then a gigantic step-up in valuation if you're successful in phase three clinical trials. Vicuron was acquired by Pfizer for $1.9 billion. Now, we've been very lucky to get some guidance on our team, uh, on our uh, business development, from several great individuals in the Boston area. Jeff Elton, CEO and Senior Vice President at the Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research down the street from us in Cambridge. Mark Leuchtenberger and George Eldridge, who are CEO and CFO of Terganta Therapeutics, an antibiotics company that has recently been bought out by the medicines company. John Hebert and Radhika Trupa Renini, a Genzyme who've been helping us a little bit with business development. 
as well as who's, who've put us in touch with the um, manufacturing executives that helped us with our GMP uh, manufacturing protocol and optimization. And Jason Fuller, who's a senior associate at Third Rock, has been teaching us a little bit how the venture world works. And now, our active team of scientific well, advisors. Did, yes. Has Genzyme, you, you have two biz dev people mm -hmm. from Genzyme, have they expressed interest in discussing a deal with you? Uh, we have not formally discussed interest. However, they are very much uh, interested in keeping uh, on helping us, so we hope we can cultivate that relationship going further. Genzyme, however, has not, does not have an antibiotics, a proprietary antibiotics development program yet. Maybe that's us, we'll see. Um, our active team of scientific advisors, Jim Collins, who's my PI, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Investigator at Boston University, pioneer in synthetic biology and systems biology, as well as a MacArthur Genius Award recipient and a co-founder of two biomedical companies. Bob Langer, who's a very prolific inventor, more than 600 patents, more than 800 publications, as well as a co-founder, on top of that, of 20 successful startup companies. Uh, Greg Stephanopoulos, who's a metabolic engineer, as well as a bioinformatics expert, also a startup founder, and Bob Rubin, who's at Harvard Medical School and is the chief of infectious disease at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, who's been great in teaching us about the infectious disease world and how the clinic works. So with that, thank you, and we'll take more questions. So it would look like from that list, I mean, <coughs> any two of them could write a $250,000 check, so. Yeah, so um, even though they personally could write us significantly more than $250,000, they are getting equity in our startup company because they will be investing their time and their guidance as parts of the boards. And importantly for them, a validation is also for us if we can get some money of our own because otherwise they would not feel it is justified for them to invest their time or money. This is, um, so the last startup that uh, Bob, can you go back? Sure. The last startup that uh, uh, Bob Langer and uh, Greg Stephanopoulos put together uh, was uh, Stericote, uh, also renamed Sempras Biosciences. And the model that they go to is to not invest their own money. This, they just take a co-founder, they invest a lot of time in guiding the people that build up the company, but typically that's not the model that they go after. They don't write checks for. Uh, keep that money. They keep the money. <laughs> they get equity on top of that. So. so who do you want to raise money from? Venture uh, guys? Angels? That, that's a great question. Actually, right now, we don't want to raise money from venture capitalists. We want to get a step up in our valuation, so we want to raise it, hopefully, from an angel investor. And I don't want to put out any names, but we've had some talks uh, because we've been circulating around MIT, Harvard, and BU. And there are several um, alumni of these universities who are interested. On the other side, like you mentioned, there's grants from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Mm -hmm. There's internal, like uh, ignition grants located at BU and MIT, mm -hmm. like the Desponde grants that are available to us, and we are looking towards to applying for those. Yeah. There are also some direct NIH challenges regarding uh, biofilms and infectious diseases that we think represent a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit of a longer timeline um, to get that money in. That is correct. So, we're so what scares you the most about it? I'm sorry, say that again, please. <laughs> what scares you the most about going forward on the project? The risk that keeps you up at night. I, please go ahead. I would say the regulatory risk yeah. is it's my biggest thing. Um, as we mentioned, natural bacteriophage have been approved. We think there's a manageable way to go through it. But mm -hmm. any um, basically new therapeutic company, especially coming out with an advanced agent mm -hmm. that's a biologic, has risk associated with it. Now, we are very committed to it because we think the payoff in terms you know, of a societal point of view and as a financial point of view is positive. But that's the risk that keeps us up at night. Yeah. To, to frame it differently, it's not the technical side because we've been working on that for several years in the lab also at night and at, during the, yeah, <laughs> during the yeah. day. What keeps you up at night? Just doing the work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just doing work, exactly. But in truth, it is also not the business development because there are several great guys in the, in the Boston biosciences and, and venture community. It really is the regulatory uh, route and we hope by engaging the FDA first informally and then also through the formal channels that we can get enough guidance so that we can get our data and our clinical models and clinical trials in close accordance with what they're really looking for. Is there a veterinary angle on MRSA? Yes. Actually, I think in the recent New York Times, they've kind of featured MRSA in swine mm -hmm. environments. I mean, there's a lot of antibiotic resistance that seems to be brewed out in the community. Um, we think that's one possible way to go. We haven't evaluated it fully yet, mm -hmm. but there's definitely something in the back, in the back of our head. That's actually, uh, that's actually a great question because um, bacteriophage are also used to um, spray the hides of cattle before they are being put into the slaughterhouse. So when you have this kind of treatment of, a, uh, of the hide, which is actually the most contaminated area of the, uh, of the animal and not the rest of the slaughterhouse, you really want something that is as efficacious as possible in order to get like any and all of these bacteria out there before they get into the food processing chain and end up in your meat or my meat. Good. What does the average PhD from MIT make coming out? It depends, it depends if they Depends on what you study, yeah. I would say. <laughs> um, 
It, it, does, it does depend if you work on Wall Street. That used to be very good, and nowadays it's probably not so much anymore. <laughs> but the average numbers that we've seen circulating around is between $96,000 and about $100,000. And that's probably industry specific. If you go into academia, it's much lower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who's, uh, who will be working on the, uh, uh, who's doing the primary science right now? As a re all right now. Right, right now, now, all three right. of us are doing, yes. moving forward, uh, Tangi and Mike will be handling more of the product development, the first clinical product. Um, when I start my lab up as, uh, at MIT, I'll be working on more of the core technologies, see if we can innovate some of the more uh, effective approaches and hopefully bring that to market as well. So we're very aligned in that, mm -hmm. in that you're design. Gonna, you're going to stay at MIT? Yes. Yeah. We, have, we, have a clear, uh, we have a clear separation on our team. We have, we have a genius and we have some people that do the product <laughs> development. Do you have, uh, you said you had sponsored research uh, commitments are likely do, in the licensing arrangement? I'm sorry, I misspoke. There is a clause in the uh, standard term sheet of BU and MLT, MIT that would require us to spend a significant amount of money in the form of sponsored research agreements without any agreement that the IP would be transferred back to us in, on their money. So essentially they want to have us sponsor some of the research and we we're just not going to do it so, because it doesn't work. Okay. We have I can time show for you. one more comment. Okay. <laughs> I'll show you a picture of it. There you go. I can just show you. I would, if you have any comments, that'd yeah. be great. But this is just a picture of the biofilms. Um, up on top, you can see basically an untreated biofilm, multiple cells lying on top of each other. Treating with an unmodified bacteriophage leaves a lot of bacteria still stuck to the surface. With the engineered bacteriophage, you can see a significant amount of clearing. And we've done you know numbers of counting, of course, but this is just some visual evidence of how this works. This is E. coli again. Excuse me? This is E. coli? Mm -hmm. This is E. coli again, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.